but not least, we will have Dr. Irfan Ahmad Rana from the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the National University of Sciences and Technology in Islamabad, Pakistan. He's a professional urban planner and is currently working um, in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And he obtained his op postgraduate and doctoral, degree, doctoral degrees from the Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand. With over 30 research publication, he's working towards the integration of sustainable urban development, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adaptation philosophies. So you see it's a very colorful, a very broad, a very rich panel, which we are going to have um, with a lot of different perspectives, some rather practice-driven, some par, uh, rather technical-driven, some academic-driven, and I'm myself very much looking forward to have the six inputs now. So I stop my screen sharing right now and would directly hand over to Mr. Omar Ajazi. Thank you, Christian. I'm just gonna pull up my presentation now. Okay, um, good morning, and everyone. Omar, sorry, one, one further thing. Could you also switch on your camera when, you, when you're speaking? Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Um, so good morning, everyone. I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada, where it is bright and early. So today I'm going to briefly present some work that I've been doing with the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or ESCAP. Um, on an inclusion and empowerment approach to climate action. So some of this work has been captured um, in the 2019 ASCAP report titled um, Accelerating Progress and Empowered, Inclusive and Equal Asia and the Pacific. And it has a dedicated chapter on climate action. Um, and the work arises from a very um, simple end of thinking that the very structural constraints and drivers of inequality that prevent progress towards the sustainable development goals, um, particularly for groups that have been historically, persistently, and systematically marginalized, also exacerbate the consequences of um, climate change. Um, so therefore, climate action must also tackle these very underlying relations of inequality that prevent um, SDG progress um, to maintain or improve the adaptive capacities of natural, social, um, and economic systems. And there's, uh, there's plenty of support from the literature on this. Um, for example, you know, impacts of climate change has been noted to um, intersect with race and gender. Um, for, uh, for instance, studies show that lower caste families and women in um, the Himalayan region in Northwest India and Nepal are more susceptible to the effects of climate change and less able to adapt successfully. Um, another example will be the Irrawaddy Delta in Myanmar um, which lies in the path of frequent uh, tropical cyclones, but it is also home to predominantly ethnic minority farmers. Um, so the interactions between drivers of inequality and climate change can lead to complex, um, new, and emergent forms of vulnerabilities that need careful centering. And some of these are, are summarized um, in, in the table here. Um, and even intuitively, it is unlikely that um, a climate action can be successful um, unless it also simultaneously um, addresses the structural causes of inequality um, and vulnerability. Um, so based um, on a stakeholder consultation with over some um, 600 um, participants from governments, think tanks, um, and civil society in the Asia Pacific region, a series of barriers to empowerment, inclusion, and equality um, were identified. And using this list of barriers at the starting point, a framework was developed which offers you know, four synergistic and interlinked uh, pathways um, for strengthening um, empowerment and inclusion. And they've been quickly captured um, in this diagram on, on the slide. And the four pathways are basically um, you know, rights and justice, um, participation and voice, um, resources and capabilities um, and norms and institutions. So the usual stuff that you will find in development literature. Um, and the idea is, is that if governments and external interveners design climate actions that also simultaneously support 
of strengthening some of these pathways for empowerment and inclusion, um, greater resilience to climate change um, can be achieved. Um, let's take, for example, the pathway titled um, resources and capabilities. Um, and that's been summarized as the essential and productive resources um, including social protection and safety nets, as well as capabilities to control them and have a choice um, in their use. So while resources such as technology, knowledge, and skills can certainly contribute to climate resilience, access alone does not guarantee um, empowerment. Um, um, for example, you know, cash interventions after the 2010 monsoon floods in Pakistan uh, provided financial assistance to, to rural uh, beekeepers. But fail to empower these small scale honey producers to obtain fair market prices um, from wholesale purchasers. So the beekeepers actually did not end up making a living wage despite all their efforts and the cash inputs. Um, and then what we did was that we analyzed um, hundreds of climate actions that have been undertaken in the Asia Pacific region which um, attempt to integrate some form of empowerment and inclusion um, roughly along um, the four pathways um, um, shown earlier. And, and to no surprise, we found that climate actions grounded in an empowerment and inclusion framework in some form was more effective in combating climate change as opposed to interventions which are not guided um, by such an orientation. And um, based on our analysis, we were able to offer some recommendations um, and I'll just um, mention a few. Um, so one was that incorporating rights-based approaches to climate action, such as rights mapping, can enhance the outcomes of uh, said climate action. And this is a, a tricky one um, uh, because uh, proposals for integrating human rights standards um, and the guidelines for implementing the Paris Agreement was met with some resistance at COP24 in 2018, as this approach emphasizes progressive improvements in existing rights and greater accountability um, within nation states. But there's also um, a growing body of evidence that poorly designed climate actions have counterproductive human rights impacts, um, particularly on, on the marginalized. And rights mapping is a successful and tested strategy that spatially represents the different entitlements um, held by various stakeholders and how they may change uh, due to climate action. And this has been used in many contexts, including the context of IEPAs or indigenous protected areas. Um, another recommendation that came out from the work was that institutional structures for decision making must be realigned to ensure that the groups most um, affected by the impacts of climate change have adequate representation and voice. Um, and this includes the integration of traditional and indigenous knowledges within scientific processes um, and supporting lo uh, local organizations that enable participation of vulnerable groups in climate actions, um, such as the creation of farmers associations, for example, and then ensuring that they're actually given um, a seat at the planning table. Or ensuring the inclusion of communities uh, most affected by climate change within let's say international um, climate negotiations. Um, another uh, recommendation that came out was that countries must also provide resources for building climate resilience that simultaneously create capabilities um, in vulnerable groups to tackle various drivers of inequality. Um, for example, uh, the support of social enterprises, uh, which can integrate economic activity um, with uh, nature conservation, for example. Then we also noted that there's an urgent need to conduct very uh, context specific research and collect disaggregated data to identify emergent vulnerabilities, and then use this knowledge to tailor climate actions to meet diverse societal needs. Um, this is essential for expanding understandings of emergent vulnerabilities and to explain you know, outliers um, and existing data sets. And this will also help us further understand the interplay of climate change and inequality and how inequality multiplies the effects of climate change and how climate change in turn can deepen existing inequalities or create new ones. So um, linking further with social protection in the context of uh, climate action, it is then necessary to ask who is being targeted uh, by, the, by the side climate action and who is being left out. Um, what are the explicit or implicit assumptions about these different social groups that inform that climate action? And lastly, how can a more intersectional approach be adopted that may bring in other overlooked features of marginality um, to these discussions? 
Um, in, in conclusion, um, I'm placing empowerment and inclusion at the heart of climate action can first of all increase the effectiveness of climate actions and at the same time can accelerate the achievement of sustainable development goals, resulting in increased resilience to climate impacts. Um, but at the same time, we need to also invest in, in an evidence bank um, to kind of uh, get micro level case studies that can actually uh, you know, represent um, and capture the effectiveness of climate actions to reduce inequalities and also vice versa, the interventions targeting um, reduction inequalities can also, for example, strengthen perhaps um, climate action in return. Um, so I think I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Oh, wow, that was really on the spot and well within your time frame. wonderful. Um, are there questions directly coming from our viewers or listeners? So far, I don't see any question in the Q&A section. So maybe I start with one. Um, so you said that inequality and climate change more or less form a very risky alliance and inclusion and inclusive in clim uh, climate action are key. Um, when you talk about this um, uh, guidelines which you presented now, where do you see the main hurdles when it comes to um, implementation and who are the players who who impose that hurdles? Is it rather on the local, national or international level? You mentioned COP, for example, um, but where do you try to feed in your work on the local, national, international level and where are main hurdles? I think this research was done, it was mostly directed at the context of extremely marginal and an exceptionally vulnerable groups. So people mm -hmm. who have been historically removed from and the gains of climate actions, or historically who've been identified as outliers within certain data trends. Because um, there is a certain argument within some countries that, you know, we've done this, this kind of interventions and they affect most people, but they maybe they don't really benefit certain groups such as this and this and this. That's why they show up outside, you know, the impacts and, and so forth. The idea really was, you know, those numbers of people are not small in number. They're actually quite a substantial component of the population in many developing countries. And this work is again is done in, in the Asia Pacific region. So how do we actually create a, a, some kind of, a, not really a guideline, some kind of pathway to kind of encourage governments to actually begin thinking about those groups more purposefully within, within climate action. So then the idea was, how do we, you know, create, build, you know, reintroduce basic, you know, components from developmental literature, such as empowerment, inclusion, participation, all these things. I mean, within the, the range of options and the portfolio of, of options that are available for decision makers um, to do this, to do uh, climate work. So we did start first at the local level. Um, so let's say at the sub-national level, sub-regional level, and then we moved upwards towards more guidance for a national level policymakers, essentially. And I think, um, but everybody has a stake to play, obviously, in this conversation, including international um, mediators. Okay, so a very holistic approach then. Thank you very much for this very rich insight. And um, I'm really 100% convinced and, and surprised that we stick within the 10 minutes time frame now. So thank you very much, Omar. And I would now like to hand over to Sifula, who will be our second speaker. And Sifula, I think you're all ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. This is a great opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, sorry, Sifula, I think okay. the, the yes. sound quality is a bit bad. All right. Let me, let me start, I think. Let's try, let's try. It's, a, it's not really loud, but um, if you try to speak up a little bit, I think it's, it's okay for all the listeners. Yes, okay, I will, I will, I will do that. All right. Welcome everyone uh, to our presentation today. And our talk is uh, integrating climate risk insurance with social generation programs. Um, I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of Bangladesh. Sorry, Sifula, uh, this is Ibad, so I'm sorry. Uh, we might need to do a bit of technical adjustment. Um, Christian, shall we then skip to the next presentation in the while, uh, meanwhile, while Sifula tries to figure out technical issues? 
yeah, maybe if you have a direct mic or something, maybe it's better because it's really hard to understand you. Yeah. Um, so I give you some time to to maybe make some technical adjustments if possible and would directly hand over to Roxana if possible. All right. Then we'll jump into the third, the third slot. Okay, so Roxana, sorry for uh, bringing you on the spot right now without any preparation, but I think you are um, ready to go and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, I'm very happy to be here and give me a minute to uh, to share my screen. So hopefully you can uh, hear me clear and can see my presentation in full screen. Yes, it works. All right, perfect. One second. All right, so uh, hello everybody. Uh, within the next seven minutes, I will give you a brief introduction on the participation of SMEs in collective flood adaptation and explain how this topic relates to the discussion on adaptive uh, social protection. Um, yes, yeah, as, as you uh, can see, my case study is uh, in Ho Chi Minh City. So Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam is a prime example for an urban area at already current flood risk, which will be intensified by climate change impacts. And particularly floods are a growing economics concern for um, local firms in the manufacturing sector. And in particular, micro and small firms are mostly impacted by flooding. So um, yeah, the viability is uh, closely connected to the livelihoods of employees as they are responsible for value and job creation at the local level and also in um, local neighborhoods. But uh, despite the increasing flood risk, um, it's usually, well, usually the economic sector in Vietnam so far is lacking some kind of insurance schemes or other protection measures. And local firms, uh, firms usually have to deal with the impacts of floods uh, mostly on their own. Um, so what do we know from literature on risk reduction and climate change adaptation regarding SME's response to floods? So the initial findings in research show usually that smaller firms, particularly in the urban context, usually um, yeah, rely on pure coping measures, which are reactive and short term in nature. So even with an eye towards the upcoming climate change impacts, they usually do not follow long term adaptation strategies. So I argue that firms future risk behavior remains more or less unclear, but Obviously, we need more information on this point in order to find and also yeah, evaluate protection and support mechanisms that are particularly working in the future. And um, against this backdrop, um, I am testing if collective action approaches could be a good starting point for future um, long term adaptation and also somehow for social protection. Um, on this point, I see two major challenges, uh, challenges in research. So first, the need to better understand what determines SMEs adaptation action in general, and second, the urgent identification of, me of mechanisms um, that can be put in place to enhance collective adaptation. Um, against this background, I was asking myself on the one side, what adaptation measures can usually work and can work in the future? And on the other side, what measures cannot work in the contextual situation of Vietnam? And in more general, um, what preferences of adaptation measures do SMEs have? And um, to get closer to the answer to this question, I used a future-oriented approach, with, which is called scenario-based field experiments, which are um, based on behavioral economics and public good game rationales. And um, yeah, I was testing the willingness of SMEs to financially participate in flood adaptation measures um, for example, in the installation of dike systems, the maintenance of drainage systems, but also some soft um, adaptation measures like um, awareness programs under different funding constellations and support constellations. For example, funding support from local authorities, but also from other firms in the neighborhood and the community and the residents. So in general, I am kind of evaluating and testing different collective adaptation scenarios. Um, yeah, I just want to give you a few key results on SMEs engagement in collective adaptation. So first, we definitely see a preference for low cost and soft measures that meet local needs. And 
over hard and structural measures, which are historically and usually chosen in Vietnam. Uh, second, we also see a strong preference for measures which are guided and particularly co-financed by the local government. Um, third, um, we state that st um, strong networks in the neighborhood, for instance, with business associations that act as a voice for SMEs and which promote their concerns, but also with other firms in the neighborhood, play crucial roles for collective adaptation. And last but not least, and I think for our case really interesting, is that we see that the most vulnerable firms, which are already highly impacted and which have limited access to financial resources like credits, for example, and which do not receive any assistance so far, these are the firms which are willing to participate in collective adaptation. So I think we can conclude that in general, at least in our case study, collective adaptation can be understood as an approach for firms that usually fall down the wayside in terms of social protection, for example, by insurances and access to financial, financial resources and firms which are not able to deal with future flood impacts on their own. Mm, yeah, last but not least, um, I want to talk about which implication, implications from my research, which is yeah, more focused on climate change adaptation and can be derived for our discussion on adaptive social protection. So regarding the key challenges, I think that particularly in Vietnam, adaptation responsibilities yet remain more or less unclear. So I think there is a growing need to clarify the role of the state, of the private sector, but also individuals in these different debates of social protection, climate change adaptation, also disaster risk reduction, which are kind of overlapping. Um, second, I think we really need to evaluate which approaches or also which protection mechanisms could work, which don't work, particularly in different localities. And um, third, so far, I think information and protection support mechanisms, even if they are, if they are already existent at the national level, are sometimes not triggered down to the most vulnerable um, firms at the local level. Um, in order to respond to these challenges, I think we really need to bridge between scales and actors, which means we need a better use and selection of multiplier organizations and actors, and we need to push stronger the collaborations of stakeholders in order to develop, for example, risk transfer mechanisms. And in the same line, I think creating political conditions and also to foster institutions for the establishment of, of those mechanisms are really, or is really important. And we can also discuss, for example, if collective measures can be a tool somehow to ensure pro social protection. Um, yeah, and regarding my methodology, I think it's always a good point to find place-based solutions that are working and e evaluate those kind of solutions. And I think, um, yeah, future-oriented approaches like scenario-based field experiments are yeah, a valuable and helpful tool to do so. All right, so let me conclude with my main takeaway message. Um, I think SMEs in the local context have somehow a dual role to play. So they, on the one side, have to be protected from climate change impacts, but they could also act as knowledge guiders for climate change adaptation and also for social protection. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roxana, very much for this uh, very good, insightful presentation with an example now from, from uh, Ho Chi Minh. I, again, ask our audience if there are questions. Uh, so far, I don't see any questions in the Q&A section, but there's one in the chat. Um, under the collective adaptation measures, are there any formal institutions formed by these SMEs in Vietnam that can be effective in delivering a climate adaptation plan at the local level? Do they have any financial contributions as well? Yeah, I would have more or less a similar question. Um, do they form up groups on themselves or do you need external players, for example? But let's take this question first. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, this is a really good one. And I was um, starting these kind of future oriented experiments because I did um, more, a couple of interviews with SMEs and some kind of um, economic players in Ho Chi Minh City regarding these questions. And I see 
most of the firms are um, acting individually and not as collective actors. And this is why I was trying to understand what drivers or what determinants can drive collective adaptation because so far I don't see any formalized um, institutions um, yeah, to trigger those kind of actions. So because I think this is a really interesting field of, of study and there is uh, still lots of work to do. Okay. Daljit, I hope that answered your question. I have a second one. Um, when you um, studied the SMEs there, um, how well are they informed about risk transfer mechanisms? Is it now, is there a good capacity, a good knowledge about these instruments? And do we just need to, to activate them? Or is, is it just the, uh, rather the case that we first need to do some capacity training, some education, et cetera? So what's the level of knowledge about climate change, risk transfer mechanisms, et cetera, with the local actors in the SMEs? I think for the SMEs, it would really be um, important to do some educational training about those risk transfer schemes, because usually firms always complain, oh, there is no insurance for us. We, we have insurance against, for example, fire and accidents, but we don't have any insurance against flood impacts and water rising and coming into our um, company, stuff like that. So insurance is the only thing I always heard about in my experiments and also in my interviews. But I think we maybe need to do some capacity buildings on both levels, like on the level of SMEs, but also on the level of the, um, yeah, of the, public authorities on the on the local level, but also on the state level. So, and I think because Vietnam is kind of a former socialist country, I think they are opening in political ways, or also in economical ways, but I think there is lots of work to do to, to create some kind of institutions and political conditions that we can, yeah, trigger those kind of risk transfer schemes. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, I see a question from, from one of our panelists, from Thomas Loster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for your great uh, presentation. Uh, when I visited Vietnam, I saw that the North and the South are totally different countries in my eyes. So uh, really East and, and Western uh, oriented. So wouldn't there be a stronger chance in the South to put something together with private sector acting people or is the, is the country not yet so uh, in this position? Mm, yeah, thank you very much for the interesting question. Um, I think there is an avenue to go into those kind of also private sector and market oriented collaborations. Um, I've heard from some initiatives in Da Nang, which is also more in the central or southern parts of Vietnam that they're trying to foster private sector um, collaborations in adaptation, also in climate change adaptation. And yeah, I, I think there's lots of work to do, but from my point of view, and I, I was always doing um, yeah, my research in southern parts of Vietnam, and I think also some most of the public sector um, or public players are opening up to those kind of ideas. Yeah. But this is my, my point of view, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Roxana, for this very insightful presentation. And now I think we give some more minutes to Zifula to uh, get rid of his technical problems. And I would now hand it. Well, have you solved it, Zifula? Can you hear me now, Christian? Yes, now we can hear you. So, I think okay. last time I was on your Okay, so we now go with Sifula and he will introduce us to the topic of poverty reduction, social protection and climate risk finance, provision of sustainable insurance in Bangladesh. The floor is yours and thank you very much for your presentation in advance. Thank you very much, Christian, and uh, my apologies to the audience uh, for the technical uh, disruption. Let's start our presentation in the next uh, seven to ten minutes. We'll try to summarize our work. Uh, titling Integrating Climate Risk Students with Social Protection Program, the Practice of Climate Risk. Uh, that is the broad aim of our work, and here is a list of benefits 
Uh, we are uh, sorry so fuller to interrupt again but somehow every time you move a little back from from your screen it gets really bad that is uh, sound quality but if you stick like this it's okay so maybe you just uh, try to stay only 10 centimeters in front of your screen and then it works out let's okay. try lovely thank you for the feedback so the benefits we are basically targeting is to get synergistic effect uh, between the instrument in the portfolio and we are trying to add <clears throat> climate related or uh, risk transfer instruments in the portfolio of government's social protection uh, interventions. <clears throat> and the second benefits we are aiming to is transferring climate risk burden from the poor and taxpayer shoulder to the eligible industry. And it will add uh, the predictability, speed and certainty of the payout by setting clear rules trigger by uh, formulation of the instruments, as well as tracking facilities. And it will help us to, <clears throat> to uh, start a kind of proactive uh, and systematic social protection system in the country that will reduce the politics of aid. And it will help us to layer the risk of social protection to give some sort of risk, which is regularly occurring event uh, that can be managed by the social protection as well as the less frequent and more intense shocks can be managed by the climate insurance. And we hope that the public expenditure um, will have a kind of efficiency, it will create value for money and as well transparency. <clears throat> Let us have a short uh, country brief. Bangladesh as, uh, is because of its geographic positioning, it is highly prone to you can say all kind of uh, climate related disasters and uh, its ranking is there as seventh uh, among 10th flood and storms basically consist the major proportion of the disasters uh, however it has shown over the years uh, very pragmatic leadership regarding the policy design policy formulation and also its presence in the international leadership regarding climate related efforts Let's uh, have some discussion regarding the social protection scenario of the country. From the bar chart, you can see from here, gradually over the period, there is increased pressure on public funds. The uh, budget for the social protection has been increased. However, the coverage is still very poor. It is 16.61% of intended beneficiaries. Uh, but the programs are very much fragmented. The social protection portfolio has 125 different programs. Here is a picture you can see from the violet bar at the left. Uh, this is the largest proportion that has been covered by the social protection uh, portfolio. Uh, and surprisingly, the poor and non-poor beneficiaries from the social protection system is uh, surprisingly high for the non-poor proportion it is 80% and for the poor it is 20%. And the bar I was talking about, this is a pension for retired government employees and their families. So in summary, the caveats what we find from here is the annual budget for social protection is uh, really low. It, it, it basically, uh, it excluded 84% of the intended beneficiaries. And in the next layer, we can see there are problems regarding targeting, there are problems regarding the design of the program. There are problems regarding overlapping objectives, implementation errors, and infrequent surveys. And then it comes down to the grab of the major share by the non-poor beneficiaries. There are pensioners, there are investors in the government saving instruments. And then it leads down to the undeserving poor through mismanagement, political capture, leakage, and corruption. And however, the insignificant amount reaches to the deserving poor that is very small to have a scalable impact. A little brief about the insurance scenario in the country. Insurance penetration rate is very, uh, very much low. That is 0.049% of GDP, whereas the global average is 7.26%. Although the national insurance policy has projected to have 4% of GDP penetration by next year, it is, I think, a distant reality now. There are some experimentation have been done regarding climate and insurance interaction, but that is mostly predominantly on agriculture and 
mostly index-based uh, or weather-based agriculture insurance. This is kind of the framework we are thinking here because the country is now in a situation of uh, reforming and revising its different policies and uh, uh, I mean uh, and programs that that's how we, we think that this is the right time for the policymakers to think about this integration. From the climate risk insurance side, um, the government is now in the revision stage of uh, its climate related uh, strategies. From the social protection side, we can say that the government is now in its reform stage of its uh, social safety net programs. And from the interaction side, we can see that the government is now in a stage of formulating its national social insurance scheme. So we think this is the right time for the government to think about the integration. And this integration will bring some co-benefits of uh, integrating different development teams, different development policies and budgets together. We need to go through some steps, uh, system preparedness, blending of uh, or integrating of the tools and response options. Here, <clears throat> if we just uh, see the scenario uh, from the COVID until here, until today, Yesterday, there is a, a write-up of the Prime Minister in The Guardian. Uh, she was writing about a third of my country was just underwater. And uh, this is coupled um, with the scenario of, you can see from the picture, that some two people with protective equipment, they are evacuating the people, vulnerable people from the flood prone areas. So this, I can, I, I can tell that this is a triple figures for social protection, one after another, COVID, then followed by the cyclone and followed by the flash flood. So what is the preparedness of the country? There were no comprehensive lists ready in hand. The government started to prepare a new list of the poor after COVID hit and the political capture of beneficiary lists and rations. Somehow there is some good news that the government had experimented some uh, new concepts and ideas for targeting the poor people. And <clears throat> One striking statistic is the stimulus package for the COVID has been declared in April. By this time, only 9% of the poor has been reached out, whereas 100% of the uh, well-off people have already got their stimulus package. In the integration tool uh, stage, basically uh, here the government has to decide where they will uh, and which stage they will actually integrate the instruments. Is it macro, meso, or, or micro level? or is it multi-country or regional, national or local stage? There are some uh, new experiments have been done over the world. Uh, in our country, not, uh, we, we don't see that kind of uh, experimentation has been done. Non-insurance based integration has been done uh, with, jointly with World Food Program uh, that is for cost based financing, which is doing excellent. The scheme is designed to reach target people as soon as the flood triggers and the stimulus package reached out to the poor people before two or three days before the, the flood strikes. Here, see the smile uh, uh, on the lady's face and the person on the boat with a mask on its face is basically working like a floating area. And the, on the banner behind, it is written on the local language. They say that you don't have to pay any extra to this person to get your benefit. That is, they are assuring that there is no corruption at all to get your social protection benefits. Um, this is the second last slide, response options. We, uh, so far, who we are working with the social protection uh, scaling up system or shock response or adaptive social protection system. We, by this time, uh, very much aligned with this. Uh, themes, vertical, horizontal, piggybacking, design tricks, uh, concepts. For Bangladesh to implement these concepts, there are some bottlenecks. There are absence of a core set of social protection programs that have nationwide coverage. Most of the programs have coverage up to 1% to 3% of the population. So that is making a difficulty to have a vertical expansion of, of any kind of um, <clears throat> social protection program. Moreover, the digitizing of social protection information uh, and its payment delivery method is in very initial state, which is limiting the piggybacking option. And also, the system does not store information of non-beneficiaries, which prevents horizontal expansion and design tricks during the climate-related shocks. 
In our last slide, we will have three key implementation challenges. We have lack of core set of program uh, that has national coverage, including urban climate margin. We have problem regarding the beneficiary data sets with high inclusion rate in frequent surveys targeting is under political capture. Uh, the program is in by nature is reactive uh, and ad hoc, which lacks uh, the risk transfer instrument. Our key three uh, takeaways, our key way forwards from here is we urge the government to consider nationwide climate responsive social protection program during this ongoing reform process. We hope that uh, the government will keep the targeting process open and it's and dynamic. They will solve the donors dichotomy of universal versus targeting approach. And they will include climate risk insurance to facilitate transformation into proactive trigger based and risk layered social protection program. The main takeaways of learning from here is incorporating financial instruments to transfer climate risk burden from vulnerable people to the eligible insurance industry. And we wish, like social insurance, it is high time to consider climate insurance as part of social protection institutions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Sifula, very much for this, again, very insightful presentation. I don't see questions in the Q&A section or in the chat, but please feel free to ask one or two questions. There's one in the chat. Uh, my colleague just told me there's one in the chat. Ah, yeah, from Sayo, very new. What is the role of the political economy in Bangladesh in favor or against expanding the social protection system to tackle climate adaptation? Yeah, this is a very interesting question for Bangladesh because um, if you say that the target based versus universal uh, social protection system, they are very much prone to keep target based uh, social protection system because uh, it gives them some benefit because the poor people then are too much attached to with them and they select actually who will be eligible, who will not. So they can exercise some kind of their power. Uh, that's, that is one uh, issue regarding selection process. Otherwise, the, regarding climate adaptation, the country is now is leading different forums uh, in, in worldwide. It is heading a climate vulnerable forum uh, it is also hosting a regional center for global center for on adaptation. So it has different commitments, global commitment, global level leadership. Um, I mean, commitment to take forward uh, its advancement regarding the development of climate related issues and adaptation issues. So in that, from that perspective, it has some political commitment to do some good. However, there are some issues that still need to be addressed to actually uh, properly reach out the poor people. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there are no further questions in the chat. I would just shoot out one further question from my side. Um, during the Academy, we also look at the national adaptation planning process from the UNFCCC. When you have a look at Bangladesh, how is the sequence? Is there first an interest in Bangladesh for example, in this new financial transfer mechanisms like uh, forecast-based finance, and then this feeds into the national adaptation plans of the country, which are forwarded to the UNFCCC, or do you get some stimulus from the UNFCCC processes, which then lead to changes in Bangladesh? So what's, what's the direction of, of these initiatives and the action going um, on in Bangladesh that's a, right now? That's a very good question. Although I'm part of the issues, uh, I think there are some working groups. They are working uh, basically uh, to lead and uh, basically represent the country in the COP. So uh, I'm working on these issues and hopefully uh, some uh, result based uh, policy formulation will lead to uh, the national uh, adjustment plan that, that means your. Uh, first position, hopefully. Okay, not sure if I got 100% because the sound quality somehow interrupted, but um, most of the parts I got. Um, the time is up for us now. Very, very insightful, Sifula. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to further discu uh, discussions and questions. Me. And now I would hand over to Israel Orimoloy. He will talk about space-based drought disaster risk and climate change assessments, strategies for environmental conservation. 
I hope everything is ready for Israel and the floor is yours. Israel, I'm not sure if you're already talking, you have to unmute yourself. Sorry, you are still muted. Now it works. Let me know. Yes, now it works. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I will be presenting on space-based drought uh, disaster risk and climate change assessment as a strategy for environmental conservation. Uh, this is my uh, overview. As we all know, drought refers to environmental and ecological anomalies, lack of water. And this particular uh, phenomenon, that is drought, is categorized based on their frequency and severity. Drought disaster, before you can resort to disaster, it, it depends on time and also the durations of its existence, as noted by Dias et al. 2020. And also frequent drought, uh, frequent drought with high intensity level will lead to uh, um, severe uh, uh, disaster. In fact, that could also lead to uh, an extreme event or a uh, climate extreme as noted uh, in Orimaloe et al. 2019 and Dias uh, et al. 2020. Conserving the environment and ecosystems around it in a changing uh, uh, climate poses major challenges uh, for environmental managers and society, especially at the local level, where people are vulnerable to natural disasters, uh, including drought disaster. Effective adaptive uh, strategies uh, for dealing with uh, climate-related disaster, such as this um, uh, phenomena that I'm discussing about here, require a spatial temporal uh, system perspective that is in order to get the um, the real uh, impact on the uh, immediate environment we need to look at long term uh, changes or in, in terms of space and time as well uh, in addressing or in evaluating drought uh, assessment there are a lot of um, vegetation indices that have been employed in the past by various uh, researcher like um, VCI, NDVI, that is a normalized artificial vegetation index, EVI, and also and um, VAI. In, two, in 1919 and 1995, uh, one of the most current and uh, well explored um, uh, uh, vegetation index proposed by Kojan in 1999, at least uh, Modis based VCI which is very, very relevant. And it can, this can hold easy to track drought events. Consequently, this uh, study aimed to further exploit the performance of Modi's VCI drought index in regional scales applications incorporated with um, a regional cl uh, climate model to evaluate drought disasters over free state province of South Africa for a period of 20 years. This is uh, the, the, my study area, uh, is a province in South Africa. Uh, recently, South Africa have been affected by drought uh, occurrence, including the study area, but more affected in, uh, um, in the Western Cape province of South Africa, where uh, uh, drought have been uh, uh, declared disaster uh, recently. Uh, this uh, the my data and method. Uh, the data was um, retrieved from APS, that is um, application for extracting, exploring analysis ready sample. Uh, is a platform or is a website on the, um, uh, NASA. And also after extracting this uh, particular uh, data, we use our programming to, to, uh, to evaluate drought uh, assessment. And also we also uh, use um, uh, CODES, a data from CODES project, where we try to know how the nearest future will look like in terms of uh, drought-related event. Uh, we discovered that between these 20 years, between 2000 and, and 20, uh, 2002, year 2000 and 2020, it was um, uh, identified that 2015 was the most affected year when it comes to drought disaster, where most of the uh, study area were affected by this event. 
and also the province was severely affected by drought in 20, uh, 2003, you can see, in year 2003, but 2015 was more affected, most affected uh, by this uh, drought, uh, disaster. And also we see 2003, 2005, and 2018, where the study area uh, was severely affected, but not as much as uh, what happened in 2015. Uh, we also, um, uh, this, the findings from this study also revealed a similar event distribution, as I said, in these three years, but not as severe as what happened in 2015. The drought index ranges from uh, zero and 40% across the study area. However, and also the year 2005, observed moderate drought condition between uh, 40 and 50%, where this, uh, the northern, uh, the northeastern part of the study area, including this uh, particular district was affected. Uh, in order to be sure of what will happen in the nearest future, we make use of um, representative concentrations uh, pathway model which uh, we explore instead of using the three models, we use uh, 8.5 uh, RCPs, which represent the high uh, uh, trajectory uh, greenhouse gas emission compared to other scenarios. This is a um, historical mean, uh, distributions of historical mean climate variables that is precipitation and also uh, temperatures over the study area. We see this is a fish, uh, fissure uh, uh, special pattern of monthly precipitation. We see that between 2000 and 2006 and 2010, which is A, we see the, uh, the, the, the patterns of uh, precipitations over the study area. It was also discovered that between this area, between, um, I mean, between these years of, um, of our exploration, we see that uh, between 2006 and 2010 received the highest lowest uh, precipitation. Why in um, uh, between, 19, uh, be between 2014 and 2050, that is where we uh, the, the study area will receive the highest precipitation about 62 uh, millimeter. Uh, this is a special patterns of projected mean monthly uh, temperature of RCP downscale model for these five scenarios that we uh, exploited in this study. It was um, noted that during this period, during this period that two, uh, between 2006 and 2010 received the lowest, highest uh, temperature, while uh, between 2014 and 2015, the study area received the highest uh, temperature uh, values. A relationship between disasters environmental conservations and social protection. As we all know, when disasters happen, we believe and we all always identify that the, uh, the vulnerable people are the poorer people. So in assessing disaster uh, uh, patterns, uh, the drought disaster pattern in this study area, we can easily identify who, those people that will be more affected in the study area. Poor people are usually most affected by environmental uh, disaster as they tend to live in the most threatened or prone areas and depend on the biodiversity. In terms of uh, drought uh, events, we know that this affects uh, natural vegetation where most of these poor people depend. That is where they earn their money, their income, and they depend on that for their likelihood. And also their destructions reversely cause severe income losses, as I said. On the other hand, environmental disasters and reversely environmental conservations can also have an impact on social protection policy by uh, causing either a loss or increase in employment, uh, income, and related access to social protections and social services. In conclusion, findings from this study uh, will suggest that the possible adaptive actions that regional, at the regional level, that what are the environmental managers can do, uh, can do regarding those people that are more affected than the other. This, uh, the outcome of this study will provide an spot for conserving the environment and ecosystem under climate change, shift towards ecologically uh, based environmental and disaster management. And uh, deforestation need to be discouraged. Why afforestation need to be encouraged? That is, those people that are the area that have been affected, we need to uh, make sure that deforestation have been discouraged in the area. Also, adaptive strategies highlighted 
uh, from this study will contribute to uh, drought disaster management in the study area, also at the national uh, level. These are some of the references used in this study. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Israel. We will provide all interested people with the presentations afterwards in our download section. Um, so if anything was too quick right now, please feel free to go to our download section afterwards. I see there's a question from the audience. Um, Hi, Israel. Were the spatiotemporal drought maps developed for the summer season or a particular month? So oh, okay. the maps which you showed, which which time of the year do they cover or uh, were they annual maps? Okay, thank you very much. It's um for summer season, at least for January or through. Okay, so I would uh, have another question. In the end, you try to point out how your results can feed in in local adaptation programs. I have a question. How do you... Um, feed in your results? Do you talk with local managers? Do you have an ongoing partnership program? Or how does your empirical academic research result get really into the heads of, of local managers? Is, the, is there a communication process or something? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, there is a communication between us. This uh, our presentation was a, uh, extracted from a bigger project where we have a collaboration with the um, National Center for Disaster Management. In the, uh, in the province where I am working. Okay, thank you very much. So um, in the meantime, we are lacking a little bit behind our time schedule, but we are still on track. So I would now like to hand over to Sayanti Zengupta from the Hochschule bonn rhein sieg and she will talk about the role of cash transfer interventions for climate change adaptation. So the floor is is used. I hope the presentation works. Yes, it, that looks good. And I Can will shut up screen? now. Yes, it looks good. So okay. we see it in the normal view and not in the presentation mode. Just a sec. Yeah. Yeah, right? now it's good. Yep. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining in today. Um, I'm just going to start with a short introduction in the work that I'm engaged in right now so that you understand the perspective that I'm going to share in the following slides. As, um, as Christian mentioned, I'm working with the Climate Center um, in, and most of our work involves adaptive shock protection, uh, I mean adaptive social protection and shock responsive social protection. So what we see is whether social protection can really be adaptive. Um, and we are working in Nepal with a lot of Bangladesh, some parts of Asia, Latin America, and we, we try to look like whether the national social, social protection systems in these countries have the potential to be climate adaptive. Um, with the with the University of Hochschule Bonn Rhein Sieg, I'm actually we are we are publishing a huge social protection handbook uh, in next uh, month, and uh, yeah, there's everything from targeting to beneficiary list to uh, digital monitoring systems. Anything that you need to know about social protection is a part of this book. It's a huge handbook for all practitioners, uh, and that's going to be a very important tool. And we have the so I've played a small role in this uh, publication. And I also work as an editor for this ma uh, for a Berlin-based magazine called The 17 Goals. And in that, I work as a communication specialist and editor where we talk about the sustainable development goals. So I feel a lot of work gets done in the research field, but then it does not get translated into um, communication. Like we are not talking about the good things. We're not talking about what is getting done. We are not talking about the progress. So uh, with that perspective, I'll just move on to the first slide. So I'm going to talk about cash transfers and its role in adaptation. But first, um, let's just uh, situate ourselves in the COVID-19 situation. What did we see? We saw that most countries, uh, they, they brought out several, several plans right after COVID-19. I mean, there are more than 200 countries which announced different measures to support the economic and the uh, economic repercussions that the pandemic was going to have. And out of that, 60% of the uh, interventions that were announced were social assistance, which means the people are not paying into the system. It's something that the government is supposed to provide just, just due to the social contract that exists in our society. 
Um, I mean, there are several countries that we see, um, for example, France or Nepal or even Kenya, which which did. I mean, we, in one of our previous presentations, we saw how the how the different uh, countries do top ups to extend coverage uh, or, you know, uh, expand the systems horizontally or uh, vertically, but these even though these systems were expanded, what needs to be kept in mind that many of these um, interventions are short term and many of these interventions were only announced for three months. For example, in Mexico, what they said that they were going to give advanced pension payments to people three months in advance, but actually these payments are supposed to be paid in any case. So it's not that the government is doing something more than, than, than what they were supposed to do. So any any time we're talking about uh, social protection interventions or the government, you know, extending coverage, it, it needs to be looked at more in details. And we need to see if, if these really translate into long term adaptation. Moving on to what does this mean for climate adaptation? A few quick um, um, things, observations that we've made during this whole time when we were doing a lot of social protection and talking about how adaptive it is. There's a lot of attention right now and that's why it's such a good time to have this academy focusing on this and what should we learn. So there's, an, there's a worldwide attention on social protection and cash transfers. There's an increased interest from all humanitarian agencies, donors and national governments to learn about this right now because we've received many requests, many um, interest in our work. Um, we've seen that focus on suddenly there's a huge focus on shock responsiveness of social protection. And as you can see this um, comic, which is actually done by me, um, we here, I, I show that we are talking a lot about social protection scalability and everything in, in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, but the bigger climate change uh, debate are the bigger things that the different countries have to actually the Paris Convention and the the targets that we have to reach. We are not we are not talking about that right now. Um, so there's a need to take a step back and see if if this is a this is a moment where we need to decide the course and are we going to do it in the shock responsive? Not not saying that it's not important, but are we not leaving a lot of other things behind? Um, so there are parallels between, so what, what I want to get at from here is that there are parallels that we can draw between the COVID-19 emergency and the climate emergency that can happen at some point in the near future. And for that, we need to strengthen the climate information uh, that will advocate for green recovery. I mean, we will be investing in infrastructure, we will be investing in health systems, we will be, I mean, we expect that we will be investing in these things. And, um, and for us, it is important, whoever working in this humanitarian space is that the that we advocate for green recovery, and we move on from just shock responsiveness to long term climate adaptation. Um, just a quick um, in uh, uh, introduction, I mean, we have already seen different system, different government examples on um, on how social protection can be adaptive. I'm just listing a few here, which are very common, uh, commonly discussed, like the Zambia Child Grant Program, uh, and this, um, so the government sends money to any uh, household that has a child of less than five years old, and it has improved the um, coping strategies of these households when they're faced with any kind of climate shock. Similarly, the, uh, the Rural Employment Guarantee Program in India, it's a huge, uh, it's one of the biggest public works program in the whole world. And 100 days of work is what is guaranteed to every household in the rural areas. And now the government is planning to combine this with a lot of um, climate resilient infrastructure building, drought proofing and watershed management. Um, Ethiopia's uh, productive safe safety net program is also something that we talk when we see that how they can uh, how how they can combine livelihood and watershed activities. So what the evidence so far shows is that there is of course a big role that social protection can play. It can play it can improve the food security and consumption levels. It can help in increasing the agricultural output. It can help improve the health and nutrition, facilitating livelihood transitions and mobility because people would probably need to migrate when they're faced with 
serious um, uh, hazard risks, improve school enrollment rates and improve security. So, I mean, we, we, there is no doubt that there is a potential for it, but what we need to keep in mind when we discuss this potential and we champion this adaptive social protection, cash transfers are extremely important, but they're not going to be enough in the longer, longer term. Even if you deliver a cash transfer without a social care component to it, without having conditionality, conditionalities to it, without having... Um, without saying that, okay, the cash needs to be used in a certain way, without those directions, we cannot ensure that this cash transfer is going to automatically translate into longer term climate adaptation. Um, th the timing of delivering the cash transfer is very crucial. Uh, in some countries, it can be when you deliver cash transfer in the beginning, it's helpful, but it helps to release a lot of stress. But in some countries where there's a hurricane probably and you do not know which track the hurricane is going to take, then you cannot deliver a cash transfer in, uh, before the emergency happens. So it is context specific. So we need to invest on early warnings and pre-established channels. Um, but uh, yeah, but we need to see that we do not go for a one size fits all solution and say cash transfers should be done with early warning systems before an emergency takes place. Uh, disaggregated data on specific climate vulnerabilities are often not captured in social protection databases. So what I mean by this is sometimes social protection, the traditional role of social protection has been to target poverty stricken households. And these poverty stricken households could be climate vulnerable, but there could be other people who are actually not in this poverty database, but are also equally climate vulnerable and actually can fall into poverty because of this. So it, what we need is like, we, we need to take vulnerability assessments to be integrated in national action plans. Um, current focus on um, cash transfer de delivery as a one-off intervention and graduation is not feasible. I mean, we cannot think that there can be a stop to this. We, I mean, at least not in the new future. We cannot think that, okay, cash transfers, we can do this for five years and graduate from the scheme. People will move out of poverty. I do not see that as the correct methodology unless we also empower other elements like uh, community social protection or things like that. So we need to take an ecosystem approach. We need to see the market policies. We need to see the scope of insurance there. So we just not need to see cash transfers, but other elements which can feed into the system and make it uh, equally viable for uh, a donor or a humanitarian agency to move out of it at some point. And lastly, targeting size, duration, and mechanisms, whatever is used for a cash transfer delivery, all of these matter. And and the cash transfer design itself should be adaptive in nature to help in climate change adaptation. Um, yeah, so my concluding statement is that there is a lack of um, impact evaluation reports, which, which says how much climate adaptation can cash transfers lead to. So the first step would be to develop a climate adaptive capacity indicator framework. And that's a very important uh, big gap that I feel there is because we cannot, that needs to be uh, used. Um, and this framework can then be used to evaluate cash transfer and other social protections to help build the evidence base. Okay, so that's all from my side, thank you. Thank you very much, Sayanti. This was also very insightful and it triggered a lot of questions as I can see now in the um, chat room. I think one or two have been already a little bit tackled in your last slide, but I would pick the first one. Um, how can a transition happen from cash transfer programs in a humanitarian response to long-term social protection? Are there any specific guidelines or maybe best practices where this already has happened? Um, so what we have, so we have cash plus approaches now. What we look at, like cash transfer programs, are incorporating other elements. Like you can have cash plus approach. Like you have to, um, I mean, one program which will also deliver cash plus it will have like employment generation, like the PSNP program uh, actually, and even the 
from Malawi and the Kenya HSNP, they are trying to integrate different cash plus approaches. So basically, when there is a drought trigger, you get the you get the money uh, delivered to your account within a few weeks of the drought trigger. But you are also trying to have a cash plus approach, which means uh, another kind. So you will have a different employment opportunity. You will have different. Um, you are trying to build the social pool uh, the, that like that you can rely on when there is a drought. You have a migration opportunity. So basically, cash plus approach means like we move on from just cash transfers into something that can be long term and. Uh, that uh, yeah that 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 is being done and it's it's not we don't have the evidence as of now but uh, yeah there are some cash plus approaches that are being tried in pilots okay perfect thank you very much uh, maybe Sayanti I can kindly ask you to answer the questions in the chat maybe in a written way because I would like to give the same and equal chances to have a full sure. 10 minutes uh, to Irfan as well so yeah. I would now switch over to Irfan Ahmad Rana he will talk about social protection in disasters and climate change a bibliometric analysis so the floor is used and you have exactly uh, 10 or 11 minutes as well or maybe one or two minutes more if you need um, because all the others were a little bit over time as well so the floor is yours thank you uh, you're still sorry you're still muted yeah. okay uh, yes so can you hear me yes we can hear you okay can you see the screen no? yeah. not yet now it works yeah Good. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you for the chance. And I've, I've gone through these uh, uh, different presentation of our other panelists, and I have seen that more of them are focused towards empirical studies, and they have a very good inputs insights into the social protection program. But I was thinking that I would like being an academician and researcher. I'm looking at social protection uh, uh, research landscape. You can say an intellectual landscape of the term social protection in the context of and the domains of the fields of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. So uh, so let me uh, introduce myself. So basically, uh, I'm working on towards the social aspects of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, which is in case of Pakistan, which I'm from, uh, and my research is focused towards Pakistan. The social aspects of disaster risk reduction is very much missing. We are doing vulnerability assessment. We are doing social protection programs. Uh, but we are more focused towards structural implications or structural uh, viewpoints of, uh, you can say, the how to reduce the disaster risk. So uh, rather on, uh, moving on towards the terminology of social protection that I have been uh, working on, researching on, that it has turned out to be a very a multidimensional uh, phenomena, which has uh, roots in poverty as well as sustainable development. Now it's turning into the climate change adaptation uh, and disaster risk reduction philosophies. So my my main work of main work is also like towards integrating different components, uh, different uh, philosophies of climate uh, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. So I have seen that different terminologies have one way or another are related to social protection program. So either it can in, uh, decrease the vulnerabilities, increase the, uh, increase the capacities. This, we see resilience as a set of capacities. Then we can say it also social protection also helps in making the communities more resilient. And then different frameworks in the world have focused or they are now working towards, uh, they, are, they mentioned social protection in their own objectives and uh, in their own uh, what you say, uh, points for the way forward. So basically what I did, I was, uh, I worked on towards the bibliometric review of this terminologies and that how and how much, how many research is already been conducted on social protection in the domains of climate change and disaster research. So why bibliometric is important? It basically bibliometric gives you current research trends of a particular or a certain research topic. So it covers how much, how much uh, uh, breadth and depth of certain topics are covered. Uh, so it is a basically a, a longitudinal methods with uh, different attributes like uh, general name, citation, number of publication. It somehow kinds of reflect how much the, um, can, uh, research is being conducted on a particular topic. So uh, I have basically worked towards having a comparative analysis of disasters, uh, how social protection is used 
in disaster terminology or disaster science and how it is being used in the field of climate change adaptation. So that my main aim for this, uh, my own research was to have a comparative look into how social protection helps in, uh, uh, how research is being conducted in these contexts. So different search criteria, I've used two different search criteria for uh, finding out the number of research papers. So I use social protection terminology and disaster. Of course, there are many interrelated terminologies that could have been used so to supplement social protection terms. But I've used, uh, just uh, for the time being, for a short presentation, I've used social protection and disaster, and one, one keyword, and social protection and climate change as another uh, search keywords. So it gave me results of 56 and 83 different research articles. And uh, sorry, these uh, research also included different conference paper or different books that are indexed in Web of Science database. Uh, I hope more of you, uh, many of you know about this Web of Science database. So what I did regarding analytical methods, I just downloaded all the articles and start studying it. Uh, what type of research is being conducted, uh, what sort of ideas or concepts or themes are being used in the social protection uh, terms uh, in the concept of di uh, disaster and climate change. So different softwares like Excel and Bosby were used to determine the differences among these two groups. So, so just coming on to the overall, just a glass of what are the total uh, number of uh, articles being published. So it, it has, it's seen that climate change and social protection publication outweigh the disaster publications. More journals are, have published on climate change and social protection than disaster. But uh, interestingly that uh, disasters, uh, social protection in terms of disasters have uh, gotten more citations as compared to the climate change group. Authors, of course, more publication, more authors, and in climate change and social protection, different keywords used by the author in the abstract are 428. That it, it outweighs the, so it means kind of, it means that social protection in terms of climate change is more diverse as compared to disaster science. Uh, and more institutions are working to, on towards climate change and protection and more countries are working on climate change and protection as compared to disasters, uh, disasters and social protection. This is general, just a general outlook uh, that the studies on social protection, research studies on social protection and disaster and climate change, well, they started in around 2000. The first publication is in 1998. And then gradually it is now, you can see some deviations, but there is regular publications coming on these topics. And uh, the 10 top, and these are the 10 top sources which have published on this disaster and social protection, climate change and social protection. These are some of the names, but uh, most of uh, the publications are in Development Policy Review and IDS Bulletin Institute of Devel uh, Development Studies and Development Policy Review Journal. Similarly, the two, the two main publications which are present in the both groups are uh, uh, the study by uh, Helper addressing human vulnerability to climate change. So it, it had both the keywords of disaster and climate change. Uh, these are the top authors which has published on these particular topics. Uh, World Bank is leading institution which has been publishing or promoting social protection in the current research trends, uh, followed by International Food Policy Institute. So these are two of the dominant institutions. And regarding which countries are publishing on social protection or which countries are uh, using this, so these are both United States and England are leading the publications on the topic. So coming to the main things uh, that, uh, uh, what, how, coming on the main thing that, how many keywords are being used simultaneously in the context of disasters. So now this is a keyword map in which these keywords are used by different authors of the study. So this kind of tells you how many concepts or interrelations of different phenomena uh, are engaged in the term of social protection. So this diagram is basically tell, telling you about social protection and disasters. So you can easily see the more highlighted word tells you the number of co-occurrence of 
one word being used in many studies. So here you can see vulnerability or cash transfers are one of the prominent keywords being rapidly used in the current research. Coming on to the climate change word. So here you can see that in terms of social protection and climate change, adaptation and vulnerability and resilience are predominantly used in the current researches on social protection and climate change. So overall view, it uh, gives you the three concepts like vulnerability, adaptation and resilience and poverty. These four concepts are consecutively used in the uh, fields of climate change and disaster reduction. So in one way or another, you can say that vulnerability and adaptation and resilience are basically key entry points for integrating the climate change adaptation and disaster reduction philosophies. So I'll just wind it up. Uh, uh, so there are limitation because I've only used one database. I've used English as the only language. And, uh, and there might be some slight uh, uh, differences in a number of results because I searched it on a particular date. So these might vary. But in concluding, in conclusion, so I would say the vulnerability adaptation resilience are strongly embedded with the disasters, climate change and social protection terminologies at least in the research domain. And USA and England are leading research in social protection in terms of climate change and disasters. But this study is basically just a baseline study for a more systematic or you can say meta-analysis review of the whole concept of social protection in disaster reduction and climate change adaptation. And I'm hoping to advance the, uh, the, all those papers I've studied or reviewed to uh, convert it to systematic review I could not be able to give you in this uh, uh, 10 minute presentation. So this is just a baseline data presentation of my findings. Uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Rifan, very much for this presentation as well. Um, I'm looking at the time. We have still two or three more minutes left. I just uh, take this to liberty. I don't see any questions in the chat room. I would have one um, question to you from my side. Um, I think your, your results are quite fascinating and they go very much hand in hand with the efforts, for example, of the UN to combine global frameworks such as Sendai with Paris and SDG. So the overall need for more holistic approaches is definitely there. Um, do you think you can feed in your results in some way of, of action processes or something or is it just a stock take now and and then that's it or, or how can do you or do you have a feeling that you can make a difference somewhere with your with your um, work yes uh, thank you christian so basically yes you're absolutely right uh, basically this is just a baseline i have advanced like i have studied the different uh, mention of the word social protection in different document of un World Bank, etc. So, incorporating this gray literature in the uh, in the study that would advance that how social protection in which context, uh, in which uh, you can say what ideas are being promoted by different research papers or reports to incorporate the term of social protection into the national uh, uh, adaptation programs. So, okay. of course, that is one of part of my study which I could not be able to show you because it required a more uh, can say it required more time basically so i just okay. gave you a simple some simple statistics okay perfect so thank you very much it was really a very rich panel now and with very different perspectives some very optimistic perspectives and i really like the presentations and uh, thank you all for staying within your time frame i think i was the one who uh, expanded the time frames a little bit too much by asking too many questions, but I was really intrigued by all the different insights. So thank you again, Omar, Sifula, Roxana, Israel, Sayanti, and Irfan for your inputs. And to the audience, if you have any further questions which have not been answered right now, please just feel free to drop us an email. We can easily reach out to all the experts and all to the speakers and we'll try to answer questions afterwards. As always, we will upload, given the permission of the speakers, um, later into our download section at the Summer Academy website. And now I just close up with an advertising part. So tomorrow we will have the part two of the um, participant presentations. Join in there, the registration is still open. And having said this, I again thank 
our cohorts from UNU EHS, MTII, LMU Munich, and um, UNFCCC. And I wish all of you a very nice morning, afternoon, evening, or even night. And I say goodbye to all of you. So thank you very much.